I've called this um, little um, talk today important issues for the family in the euthanasia debate so that it fits in with uh, what we're talking about in general through the day. And I'm in case anyone goes to sleep, I'm giving you the summary first. The end of life choice bill or some form of it will be introduced probably uh, later this year. It promises a revolution in the ethics and practice of medicine such as we've never previously seen. The measure is being driven by a small number of individuals whose concerns could be met through existing services but who refuse to accept this. And I'm going to give you the conclusion as well. And the conclusion is that we need to ask, is that a sufficiently solid reason for us to destroy nearly everything we have learned about doctor-patient relationships and the ethical basis for the practice of medicine in this country? That's the question I want you to hold in your minds for the next 25 minutes. First, some definitions. <clears throat> what is euthanasia? In the context of this discussion, it means the administration of some toxic substance or the application of some mechanical device to a person by another person with the deliberate forethought intent of killing that person. The rationale for the action is commonly given as compassion, and under New Zealand law, it's homicide. Assisted suicide is something you may have heard about. What's that? Well, it's the action of a doctor prescribing a toxic substance for supply to an individual desiring to die, who then swallows the poison privately, usually in their own home, and the doctor may or may not be present. The rationale for this action is also usually given as compassion, and under New Zealand law, it is a homicide. Now, people get confused about what is not euthanasia, and I can see the Prime Minister was struggling a bit in this area. First of all, euthanasia is not the withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, uh, medications and technical support at the request of an aware patient that is failing to contribute to the healing process. In other, words, if it, in other words, if the medication or treatment is futile, then there is no medical problem or ethical problem with withdrawing it. This is also what euthanasia is not about, the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment in situations where after careful assessment it becomes clear that the process of dying has advanced to the point where it is imminent, cannot be reversed, and attempted resuscitation would be pointless. This is also what euthanasia is not. It's the incidental death of a patient receiving medication solely intended for and given at appropriate doses to relieve suffering. Now this is a false assertion that one hears frequently. It is that doctors are performing euthanasia all the time in the hospitals. Well, that's not so. This is either a misunderstanding or a deliberate attempt to confuse the issues. Here's another false assertion that we hear, that when withdrawing treatment that is ineffective, the doctor's intention is that the patient should die. This, they say, is not ethically different from the intention of a doctor who is accelerating the death of a patient by administering some lethal substance. Anyone who says this is said to be, who denies this is said to be splitting hairs. But it is not so. In the first scenario, doctors will accept that the patient may die, but can never be 100% certain that because there are many instances of people in such circumstances surviving. If a person recovers in those circumstances, that's a positive. However, if a person survives after being given a toxic dose of some poison with the intent that it will kill them, that's a failure. Now what is palliative care? People are confused about this and some people equate it with euthanasia. It's not. It's an approach to patient care that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing problems with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other symptoms, physical, psychosocial and spiritual. It intends neither to hasten or postpone death. Now, who is demanding that euthanasia be legalised in New Zealand? Small groups of vocal advocates in most Western countries have been advocating for it since the 1930s. There was a temporary loss of interest in it after World War II for obvious reasons, but memories are short, and agitation for it has increased over the last 15 years. These groups claim, on the results of public opinion polls, to have the weight of public opinion behind them and they use this tactic to lobby MPs to vote for legislation. We heard today, the Prime Minister said, two previous attempts in New Zealand have failed. But there are problems with opinion polls. The results cannot be trusted. 
MPs and the public are getting skewed messages from them. And these are some of the problems uh, that uh, we get, have in opinion polls. <clears throat> Just going to look at some of them quickly. A study by the international pollster Gallup in 2013 showed that support for euthanasia depends on how the question is framed. When the question was worded, when a person has a disease that cannot be cured, do you think that doctors should be allowed by law to end the patient's life by some painless means if the patient and his or her family request it? 70% of respondents said yes. But when the question was worded, when a person has a disease that cannot be cured and is living in severe pain, do you think that doctors should or should not be allowed by law to assist the patient to commit suicide if the patient requests it? Only 50% thought it should be allowed. And this despite the fact that the emotive words, in severe pain, had been added. It seems that including the term suicide in a question has considerable bearing on the responses. A poll taken in 2007 by Princeton Survey Research Associates found similar findings. Respondents were 51% in favour of making it legal for doctors to give terminally ill patients, quotes, the means to end their lives, in quotes, but when the wording was changed to making it legal for doctors to, quotes, assist terminally ill patients to commit suicide, in quotes, only 44% of respondents were in favour. A further problem with public opinion polls is that the opinions they reflect are based on hypothetical scenarios. A research group in America sought to counter this by investigating the attitudes of terminally ill cancer patients on the subject. They found that 60% supported euthanasia in a hypothetical situation, but only 10.5% would seriously consider euthanasia or PAS for themselves. At follow-up six months later, approximately one-third of the original group that had been questioned had died. Of these, only one had died of what was termed physician-assisted suicide. But the biggest problem with polls is the lack of background knowledge by the respondents. There's plenty of it around, uh, but people just don't look for it. For example, reviews of Dutch practice in recent years all show that euthanasia is frequently performed without consent or request. In 2012, for example, approximately 270 deaths by euthanasia without the patient's request were reported in Holland. However, 26% of doctors surveyed failed to respond to the surveyors. If their utilisation rate was, one, was similar to that of those who did respond, the figure could be as high as 340. Nearly one quarter of physicians undertaking euthanasia did not report it, as required by laws that only allow euthanasia under Holland, in Holland under strict conditions, which includes reporting. These practices amount to illegally pushing out the boundaries, but it is a feature of Dutch medical practice tolerated by the authorities. And it happens also in Belgium and in Luxembourg and other places where euthanasia is legal. Certain members of the medical profession take it on themselves to decide if a person's life is or is not worth living. If they judge it is not, the result is euthanasia. Why would anyone be naive enough to think that the same couldn't happen here? Most of us have no ideas that these practices are typical where euthanasia is legalised. If they did know, would so many respond positively to legalising it? Now, why are these groups demanding legalised euthanasia? Well, originally, it was because of unbearable and poorly treated physical pain in people who were near to death. But with improved palliative care, the goalposts have been shifted. From the 2013 report of the Oregon Public Health Division, where um, euthanasia is legal, it oversees their death with dignity legislation. Only 28% of applicants for assisted suicide did so on the basis of inadequate pain control or concern about that possibility. Note how the two very different reasons are lumped together. Professor K.R. Stevens, in testimony to a British House of Lords committee investigating euthanasia in 2005, said, there is not one single instance in Oregon of assisted suicide being used for actual untreatable pain. It is used for psychological and social concerns. And Janet Good, a co-worker of Dr. Jack Kevorkian, the famous American um, euthanasist, who was herself a cancer victim, stated, pain is not the main reason why we want to die. So now the goalposts have shifted and the main reasons given publicly are a desire to exercise autonomy, to die with dignity, or for exi existential pain, that is suffering without physical cause. So let's briefly look at those. 
First of all, exercising autonomy and choice. This is what calls for legalising euthanasia uh, currently rest on. According to various advocates, death is variably said to be a private matter or something that the government should butt out of, or the only part of life that we're not allowed to have control over. All these assertions are demonstrably false. Death by euthanasia is a public matter since at least one other person has to be involved and rules are created around it. A government that had no legislation around death would be hugely negligent and would leave its population open to all sorts of abuses. And the claim that our dying is the only area of life that we, ca that we cannot currently control is a nonsense. Most of life's major events from birth come upon us unplanned, unexpectedly and often irrevocably. We have little or no choice over them. In fact, attempts to control the manner, time and place of our deaths are contrary to the natural laws of life and death. What about the need to desire to, of the desire to die with dignity? Well, pro-euthanasia supporters claim that the only way to die with dignity is to do it by way of euthanasia. Why, they say, I wouldn't let my dog suffer like that. Three things in response. First of all, to be dependent on others is not to be undignified, although it might hurt one's pride. To be the victim of forces outside of one's control is not to be undignified. You can even be the butt of other people's jokes and remain dignified. Secondly, if dignity is in dying is equated in one's mind with freedom from nasty hassles, don't count on euthanasia to provide it. Up to 20% of people undergoing it have some complication, ranging from difficulty getting venous access, difficulty swallowing, to fits, intractable hiccups, vomiting, failure to become comatose and waking up dead. In Portland, Oregon, a man named David Pruitt was given a big dose of barbiturate drugs with apple, mixed with apple sauce as prescribed by his doctor to enable him to commit suicide. Within minutes, he slipped into unconsciousness as his wife sat by his side. He should have passed away quite quickly, but after three days in deep coma, he suddenly woke up. Honey, he said to his wife, what the hell happened? Why am I not dead? He survived another 13 days before dying naturally. I suggest that sick dogs get put down for reasons other than to stop them suffering. No one asks their opinion. Everyone else has the power. The cost of treatments and vet visits is astronomical. It's the suffering owner who finally decides enough is enough, not the dog. But those attitudes towards humans are evident in the pro-euthanasia group. A lady stood up in one of my meetings recently and described how she felt when visiting a person living in a rest home specialising in the care of adults with disability. I was so disgusted, she said, that I wished I'd had the ability to put them all down on the spot. It's funny, isn't it? But it's actually very serious. Thirdly, what about relief from existential suffering? Well, as indications have moved away from untreatable pain, the focus has now gone on to suffering that has no clear connection with physical pain. The third indication of the end of life choice bill allows euthanasia or assisted suicide for anyone aged 18 and over who suffers from an irreversible physical or mental condition that in the person's view renders his or her life unbearable. The operative phrase here is, quotes, in the person's view. This indication could cover a variety of chronic diseases such as diabetes, Parkinson's disease, arthritis, depression and other mental diseases, poor family relationships, tired of living, fear of the future, fear of future blindness. What doctor could do deny a request in the absence of any objective measurement of unbearability? And if a doctor did deny such a request, would that be called annulling the request with the threat of prosecution for doing so and a substantial fine plus or minus a jail term? We have to ask ourselves, should we be considering killing people with such symptoms when what they lack is often support and encouragement? I wonder how many medical practitioners might eventually adopt the attitude that Dr. Richard Fenigson, a Dutch cardiologist, discovered when on asking a senior doctor during a departmental conference why he had attempted involuntary euthanasia without knowing the diagnosis on a patient who was not seriously ill, he was told that it was the calling of a doctor to perform euthanasia when the opportunity presents itself to spare people the sufferings inherent in life. Pretty frightening. Now, other reasons um, that are given. To protect the small number of doctors who currently offer mercy killing from criminal prosecutions. 
An anonymous survey conducted in New Zealand a few years ago found that 3.9 per cent of 1,000 medical practitioners surveyed had assisted a patient to die by way of what was described as euthanasia. The plea is for these doctors to be able to go on doing this without fear of prosecution. These are doctors who for various reasons are prepared to break the law of the land. They have taken steps to avoid being discovered. What will happen if the law changes and doctors are allowed to practice euthanasia without fear of prosecution, even if they fail to fully comply with the requirements of the Act? Is anyone naive enough to believe that such people will restrict their practices to voluntary euthanasia or, where it is not convenient, bother with obtaining consent? Dr. Ben Zylasis, a Polish-born oncologist working in Holland, offered hospital admission to one of his patients who had widespread metastatic cancer. His intention was to improve her anti-pain medication. She was hesitant because she was afraid of being euthanized. Dr. Zylasis reassured her that he would protect her. She was admitted and within 24 hours was pain-free. Later that day, a nurse phoned Dr. Zylasis with the information that after he had left the hospital, another physician had entered the patient's room and substantially increased her dose of intravenous morphine without prescribing it formally. Within minutes, the patient was dead. Zylasis demanded an explanation of his colleague. It could have taken another week for her to die, his colleague said, and I needed her bed. Now, even more utilitarian views are being expressed by some opinion leaders. Um, here, people are talking about the reducing the economic burden of caring for large numbers of elderly people. Euthanasia is cheap. A Dutch doctor put it this way, why do we need palliative care when we have euthanasia? This nation is looking at having to spend an increasing proportion of its finances on health and social welfare services for its aging population. However, a Treasury paper in 2002 reported that it is not the ageing of the population that is increasing health costs, it is the increasing costs of technology and drugs, expanding the range of treatments available and employment costs. But that information never reaches most people. Economic pressures on caregiving families can easily translate into older and disabled people in those environments feeling that they are a burden. And of course, in many cases, they are. But we are beginning to hear in New Zealand the same propaganda message that death is preferable to life that was preached in Holland for 20 years before euthanasia was legalised. The people who request euthanasia, we are told, are the unselfish ones. Their act is altruistic. Society expects, us, expects it of us, especially of the elderly and disabled. As a result, increasing numbers get the message that they are a burden. Euthanasia then becomes a duty. As a result, the Oregon data show that in 2013, 49.3% of applications for assisted suicide included or were solely on the basis of not wanting to be burdensome. Finnickson tells of a Dutch woman who, no longer wishing to care for her sick husband, offered him a choice between euthanasia and admission to a home for the chronically ill. The man, afraid of being in unfamiliar surroundings in the hands of strangers, opted to be killed. Do we have to kill people to prevent them from becoming burdens? And how big is the demand after all? Are there thousands of suffering people out there or is the number very small? In a recent letter to a provincial newspaper, a supporter of legalising euthanasia wrote, opponents of legalising euthanasia need to make themselves aware of the true facts of just what legislation do would do for thousands. On the other hand, other supporters are telling the public in an attempt to sound reassuring that only a very few deaths by euthanasia are likely to be approved each year. One recently suggested that Luxembourg would make a good comparison. It apparently had only 14 deaths by euthanasia in 2011-12. But of course it has only a, pop a population of only half a million. So who's correct? Are the numbers on the one hand being exaggerated to pull at our heartstrings? Or on the other, are we being asked to, un to stand our whole understanding of the ethics of healthcare on its head for the sake of a dozen people whose needs would likely have been better met by other means? What risks to the public safety does legalising euthanasia carry with it? Well, here are some of them. First of all, unnecessary deaths due to diagnostic and prognostic errors. The end-of-life choice bill can only be work out if, the, if diagnosis is 100% accurate every time, and it isn't. Diagnoses are made on the basis of, propositions, of probabilities. 
That means that not everyone who is diagnosed with a terminal disease will allow it. A middle-aged general practitioner was, was referred to my service from another hospital for terminal palliative care because of an inoperable stomach cancer. After six weeks or so, it became apparent that he was not going to die any time soon. On repeating the gastroscopy, we discovered that the previously seen large fungating tumour had disappeared. All that was left was a small erosive gastric ulcer. It's well recognised that long-standing gastric ulcers can masquerade as cancers. So we had to break the news that he was not going to die of cancer after all. He was initially not particularly happy about it, as he'd gone to some lengths to dispose of assets and otherwise prepare himself and his family for the end. But if euthanasia had been legal and he had opted for it, he would not have been around to tell the story. Nancy Crick, a patient who had received advice from pro-euthanasia campaigner Dr Philip Knightsky, died in an assisted suicide surrounded by family members. She allegedly had metastatic bowel cancer. However, in one of the few cases where autopsy had been performed following a death by euthanasia, according to the Melbourne Herald Sun, no evidence of cancer was found. Studies have shown that about 16% of diagnoses don't stand up when an autopsy is done. Prognosis is even more problematic. Every doctor has made a serious blunder in one form or another. Art Bookwald, the well-known American author, was told by his doctor in 2006 that he had only a few weeks to live and recommended that he moved into hospice care. After spending several months saying goodbye to family and friends, he had not died and after five months was discharged from the hospice. He went home and wrote a new book entitled Too Soon to Say Goodbye. He was still alive nearly a year after receiving the initial terrible prognosis, and I could give you many more examples of that. Another thing that will happen is that the uh, indications for euthanasia will gradually be broadened out. I'll give you an example from Belgium. A fellow called Nathan Verhelst, fellow or a gal, I'm not quite sure, was killed by medical euthanasia after claiming that a botched sex change operation had turned him or her into a monster. She was given a lethal injection by cancer specialist Professor William Distelmans on the grounds of unbearable psychological suffering. In most of these countries, uh, euthanasia starts out as being the last, uh, the last possibility for people who have severe pain or some severe suffering at terminal care, but they gradually become to the point where they become a panacea for all sorts of social ills. And then disregarding the requirement that requests be free or voluntary, that's often the first thing to go. Once voluntary euthanasia is established, medical practitioners begin to stretch the boundaries again, as one might predict. Um, in Oregon, Kate Cheney, aged 85 and suffering from cancer, made an application for assisted suicide. She had early dementia. As their law requires, she was referred for a psychiatric assessment. The psychiatrist declared her ineligible on the grounds that she was incapable of, moving, of making an informed choice. He noted that her family was pressuring her to make the request. Her family then consulted a psychologist who declared her to be competent but also noted the coercive role of the family. Nevertheless, she was prescribed lethal pills, took them and died. This case illustrates two things. The difficulty of being certain that a request is truly free and the fact that doctor shopping will eventually turn up someone who will accede to the applicants or his or their family's wishes. And there are other kinds of uh, things that uh, will happen. Uh, breaches of the legal protocols with immunity from prosecuting, uh, prosecution or discipline. And attempts to use it as a cost saving uh, measure. In, in Oregon, there are several cases of people who have had cancer who needed chemotherapy, who applied to the State Board for, um, uh, for funds to do that, for subsidies, were turned down, but in the same letter were told that they could have subsidised assisted suicide. So it happens. And then there are lots of, is, is, of is, uh, situations where people uh, make a request for the sake of others, that is, people in their own home, and, uh, and often that's a situation where elder abuse has been occurring in the home. So I'm going to slip over a few things here now. Um, 
I've got the question here, what risks to the public safety does legalising euthanasia carry with it? Well, one, conflicting responsibilities for doctors and nurses, who to treat and who to kill. Uh, and a, a Dutch uh, doctor says, euthanasia does not change medicine or extends its range, euthanasia replaces medicine. And here's another false assertion. It's possible to contain the practice of euthanasia through carefully drafted legislation. Well, overseas experience shows that it is not. And at least one New Zealand parliamentarian knows it's not possible. It's the one who sponsored the bill. She admitted in an interview on TV1 that it is impossible to draft legislation that someone is not going to break sooner or later. I think it's therefore cynical in the extreme to say that it is possible. Euthanasia is being opposed by a huge range of international organisations. The list is far too long for me to detail them here. It's also being opposed by a wide range of disabled persons organisations and a large number of lay, legal and medical groups around the world. Now, I'm just going to close by offering you some likely effects of legalised euthanasia on New Zealand families. First of all, there will be relief and satisfaction on the part of some if the procedure brings about the death of their loved one in the way it is meant to do. Some will be relieved for the sake of the deceased, but others for their own sakes. On the other hand, the Act will create huge tensions and indeed animosity within the family if some members approve of and others oppose a family member's application for euthanasia. It will cause anger and acute distress when it is discovered that a family member has been euthanized without any reference to the family. And I've got some examples of those things happen, but we haven't got time to go over them this morning. It will also place family members who are asked for an opinion by a potential applicant in an invidious position, especially if they are heirs of the, patient, of the person's will. And it will encourage dysfunctional families to pressure the elderly and disabled members who have become a burden to request euthanasia. We've already talked about that. It will cause major distress when the procedure is accompanied by side effects such as vomiting, shortness of breath and fits or fails to procure death. And we've talked about that too. It will also instill distress and disbelief when doctors propose euthanasia to a patient as an alternative therapy. Just one quick word about that. Catherine Judson from Oregon tells what happened when she took her seriously ill husband to the doctor for medical assistance. To her horror, while the doctor was examining him, she overheard the doctor giving her husband a sales pitch, her words, for assisted suicide. Think of what it will spare your wife. We need to think of her, he said, as a clincher. She says, if the doctor had wanted to say, I don't see any way I can help you, or that certain treatments are, worth it, uh, are not worth it, that would have been one thing. But he was tempting my husband to commit suicide and trying to decide what was apparently best for me without even consulting me. They got a different doctor and her husband lived another five years. She concludes, after that nightmare in the first doctor's office and encounters with a death with dignity inclined nurse, I was afraid to leave my husband alone again with doctors and nurses for fear they had morphed from care providers to enemies with no one around to stop them. It's not a good thing wondering who you can trust in a hospital or clinic. Is it? Thank you.